And again, the, uh, the PDF is available in Google Classroom if you don't have a physical copy of the book with you right now. Forward. War is always, in all ways, appalling. Lives are stopped in youth, worlds are ended, and even for those who survive, and the vast majority of soldiers who go to war do survive, the mental damage done is often permanent. What they have seen and been forced to do is frequently so horrific and devastating that it simply cannot be tolerated by the human psyche. Now there's an attempt to understand this form of injury and deal with it. It is called post-traumatic stress disorder by those who try to cure it. They give it a technical name in the attempt to make something almost incomprehensible understandable in the hope that by doing this, they will make it curable. But in other times and other wars, they use more descriptive terms. In the Second World War, the mental damage was called battle fatigue, and there were rudimentary efforts to help the victims. These usually involved bed rest and the use of sedative, uh, sedatives or other drugs. In the First World War, it was called shell shock, based on the damage done by the overwhelming use for the first time in modern war of artillery fire against soldiers in stationary positions or trenches. The concussion of exploding incoming rounds, thousands upon thousands of them, often left men deaf and dazed, many of them with a symptom called the thousand yard stare. The afflicted were essentially not helped at all and simply sent home for their families to care for. Most were irrational, many were in a vegetative state. In the Civil War, the syndrome was generally not recognized at all. While the same horrors existed as those in modern war, it, in some ways they were even worse because of the technological aspect of war being born then, the wholesale killing by men using raw firepower was so new and misunderstood. The same young men were fed into the madness, but in those days there, were no scientific, there was no scientific knowledge of mental disorders and no effort made to help the men who were damaged. Some men came through combat unscathed, most did not. These men were somehow different from other men. They were said to have soldiers' hearts. Chapter one, June, 1861 pretty early in the Civil War. He heard it all, Charlie did. Heard the drums and songs and slogans and knew what everybody in his rooster was crowing. There was going to be a shooting war. They were having town meetings and nailing up posters all over Minnesota and the excitement was so high, Charlie had seen girls faint at the meetings, just faint from the noise and the hullabaloo. It was better than a circus or what he'd thought a circus must be like. He'd never seen one. He'd never seen anything but Winona, Minnesota, and the river five miles each way from town. There would be a shooting war. There are rebels who had violated the law and fired on Fort Sumter, and the only thing they'd respect was steel, it was said, and he knew they were right, and the Union was right, and one other thing they said as well. If a man didn't hurry, he'd miss it. The only shooting war to come in a man's life, and if a man didn't step right along, he'd miss the whole thing. So they thought that the Civil War would be so super quick that people would like want to join and not even have time to join because it'd be over by then, which is interesting because it lasted for more than four years. What, it, what do you think it means by um, all they respect was steel? I think all their Confederates will respect is steel. Like forts and weaponry and cannons. Yeah. Like, basically, there's not going to be any talking this situation through. They're going to, like, the only thing they'd respect is going to war. Charlie didn't figure to miss it. The only problem was that Charlie wasn't rightly a man yet, at least not to the army. He was 15, and while he worked as a man worked in, in the fields all day and into night and looked like a man, standing tall and just a bit thin with hands so big they covered a stove lid, he didn't make a beard yet, and his voice only just dropped enough so he could talk with men. If they knew, he thought, if they knew he was but 15, they wouldn't take him at all. But Charlie watched and Charlie listened and Charlie learned. Minnesota was forming a volunteer regiment to go off and fight. It would have near on a thousand men when it was full, men from Winona and Taylor's Falls and Mankato, and as far north as Deerwood and from the capital, St. Paul as well. A thousand men. And Charlie had learned one thing about an army. One part of an army didn't always know the business of another part. The thousand men in the regiment would be in companies of 80 to 100 men from each section, and it would be hard for a man to know men who weren't from the same area. Charlie couldn't join where they knew him. Somebody would spill the beans and he'd get sent back or used as a runner or drummer boy. 
he wasn't any boy. He was going to sign to fight as a man and he knew a way to do it. They would gather at Fort Snelling up along the Mississippi. All the companies from all the towns would assemble there before they went off to fight. He'd just take him a walk, Charlie would, take a walk by himself until he was at Fort Snelling and there he would lie about his age and sign up as a man and get him a musket and a uniform and go see what a war was like. I won't get into any trouble, Ma, he said, wrapping some bread and cold potatoes and a half roast chicken and some tow cotton. Plus, they'll be paying me. I hear they give $11 a month. I'll send most of it on home to you and Oren. Oren was his younger brother. You can use the money and I won't be under your feet all the time. You aren't under my feet. She hated it when he talked fast. He always got his way when he talked fast. He'd smile and that cowlick would stand up in the back and he'd talk fast and she couldn't keep him from what he wanted. He was a good boy, as good as they came, but ever since his father Paul had been kicked to death by a horse gone mad when a swarm of bees landed on it, Charlie only had to smile and talk fast and he got his way. You haven't ever been under my feet. Same as, he said, shaking his head, I'm always in the way. Best I go off and see what the big fuss is all about. You ain't but a boy. And I've got to be a man sometime. You've said it more than once yourself. Charlie, you said, you've got to be a man. Well, here it is, my chance to be a man. A boy wouldn't go off to earn $11 a month and wear a uniform, only a man. So I'm going to be a man and do what a man can do. And he won. She knew he would and he did. And he took his bread and cold potatoes and chicken and left home walking down the road for Fort Snelling. And if she had known what was to come of it, if she had known and could, have, and could tell him what would come of it, she would have fought to drag him back and let the federal government keep their $11 a month. But she also had heard the songs and the slogans and seen the parades, had been to the meetings, and though it was her son Charlie leaving, she did not think it would be so bad. Nobody thought it would be so bad. Nobody thought it could be so bad. And all the officers and politicians and newspapers said it would be a month or two, no longer. It would all be over by fall. Chapter two, Fort Snelling. They didn't have uniforms for him. There was a pair of black pants that were so short his calves showed and a pair of gray socks and a black felt hat. That was the uniform he received to go for a soldier. The socks and pants were stout, but the hat was cheap. And with the first little sprinkle, it sagged around his head and drooped over his face. They took his name. The colonel of the regiment read a list of things he couldn't do. Desert his post, traffic with the enemy, steal from his fellow soldiers, act immoral or without decency. And then he signed his name, told them he was 18 and they didn't challenge it. And he was a soldier. He could read and write, Charlie could, though he hadn't had much schooling. His ma had made him stick to reading and writing and he wrote letters. He wrote her letters telling her how it was to be a soldier. The food is bad, he wrote. Beef so gamey dogs won't eat it and hard beans. We buy all the beans and use them for a meal, then use the leftover beans for soup the next day. And on the third day, take any cooked beans that are left, dry them and crush them and boil them for coffee. These are not coffee beans. They're using like soup beans to make coffee and just kind of pretending that it's coffee. <laughs> the men don't like them much and there's talk of hanging the commissary officer. It ain't but just talk, but some don't smile when they say it. There wasn't much of a war, Charlie decided early on, but there was a lot of play acting. And once he got inside, he found it mostly boring. They did something called drills and the manual of arms working in the hot sun in the compound area of Fort Snelling until they, until they were soaked with sweat. And Charlie felt he could snap his rifle from left shoulder heft to right shoulder heft as good as any man in any army had ever done it. They fired some, but there wasn't much ammunition. And when the sergeants tried to make them hit targets a quarter mile off, Charlie nearly laughed. He hunted his whole life and knew about shooting, but the rifles they were issued were uh, 58 caliber rifled muskets that fired a hollow base bullet called a mini ball named after the Frenchman who had invented it. The rifles thundered and but lacked the flat crack of his smaller bore hunting rifle and he found that nearly a third of the time the bullet seemed to fly end over end and it was all he could do to hit a target 50 yards off. Quarter mile over 400 yards seemed silly. So 
the gun that the army gave him is not even as good as his own gun. But they practiced anyway and stood and fired and dropped to one knee. And then the next rank stood and fired and dropped. They reloaded by biting the end of the paper cartridge, pulling the porter down the bore and setting the bullet on the powder with the ramrod. Then the cap on the nipple, the hammer back and fire again. They said a man could do it three times a minute, but Charlie somehow never managed more than twice. When they couldn't afford to expend any more live ammunition, they practiced with empty rifles again and again until Charlie was sick to death of the drilling and wheeling and marching and fake loading. It would be different, he thought, if the leaders knew what they were doing. But the officers and sergeants had been civilians like the rest of the men and mostly had been elected by the men themselves and had to learn as they went along using an army manual for close order drill. It seemed all they did was drill and sweat and listen to sergeants and corporals bellow at them. And as the weeks passed, Char Charlie grew more and more bored and was beginning to pay attention to his mother's letters. She had taken to thinking of the bad side of the war and was in fear that Charlie would get killed and wrote three times a week. I know it ain't right, she wrote in one letter, but you must think I'm coming home now. Just leave the army and walk home before they get you in a battle and shoot you apart. Like most of the men, Charlie doubted there would ever be a battle. Minnesota was mostly wild then, with Sioux and Chippewa Indians to the north and west, and there were some frontier forts on the edge of the wilderness to deal with any difficulties. These posts were manned by regular army troops, which Lincoln needed now to fight in the war. And there was talk in the ranks that the Minnesota volunteers would be used to replace the army troops at the frontier forts so the regular army could go east to fight. It'll all be all mosquitoes and muck, a corporal named Massey said during a break in drilling one afternoon. They don't let me go fight the rebels and I might pull foot and leave. It was all rumor, of course, but what this, with his mother's letters, she wrote more often than all the time of deserting. The boredom of constant drilling in the hot sun, and now the talk of being sent to relieve the frontier forts so that the regular army troops could go fight the rebels. One company had already been started on the march north to, to the forts. Charlie was nearly on the edge of leaving when on June 22nd, they were called into formation, ordered to get all their gear and march to the river, where steamboats were waiting to take them to St. Paul. There they marched through town with great fanfare. They still didn't have proper uniforms, but they had all been issued red flannel shirts, and though those shirts were as hot as original sin, as Charlie had heard them described, at least the men looked like a unit, marching with shouldered rifles and hats cocked forward. Girls waved and people yelled, go it boys, get the rebels, and don't stop till you hit Richmond. In a short time, they boarded other, steam, other steamboats and took, that took them south east to La Crosse, Wisconsin, where trains were waiting for them. It was all new to him. Charlie had never ridden on a steamboat, never marched in a parade or had pretty girls wave flags for him and hand him sweets. Now, as he boarded the train and saw the plush seats and fancy inside of the car, he thought, I never, I just never imagined such a thing existed. It was, all in all, simply a grand way to go off and fight a war. Chapter three. He thought he would remember the train ride forever. Most of the men had never been on a train and certainly few of them had been on one this plush. The seats were soft and cushiony and the food, especially com compared to the rough fare at Fort Snelling, was delicious. They rode across Wisconsin and down into Chicago and everywhere they stopped, there were huge crowds gathered to cheer them on. Girls gave them hankies and sweets and Charlie figured later he'd fallen in love at least a dozen times. The country didn't change much at first it was all still, un still all union. They made their way, sleeping like lords and eating like kings, Charlie thought, across Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and down into Maryland. And there were crowds all the way, even when the train didn't stop. Charlie fought, saw his first coloreds when they moved to Maryland. They looked poor and had poor clothes, and he thought about slavery then and how it must be strange to own a person so that they had to do what you wanted. He'd never considered it before and wondered what would happen after the war when the Union had whipped the rebels. Would they be allowed to keep their slaves? The war wasn't initially about slavery. The troops were going to stop the lawbreakers and wrong thinkers that were trying to bust up the Union. They talked about it at night when, while the train moved east and south and never did they speak of slavery. 
just about the wrongheadedness of the Southern crackers and how they had to teach Johnny Reb a lesson. A woman of color came up to him when the train was stopped in Maryland, just before Baltimore, and handed him a sweet roll and said, thank you for what you're doing. I hope God keeps you safe from harm and brings you back to your family. She was crying. Charlie thanked her and ate the cake and smiled at her and wondered why she was crying and wanted to ask why she was glad he was going to fight the South. She was, after all, part of the South. But they had to reboard the train then and never found out why the colored woman was crying. He did see as the train moved off that a white woman came out of the house and grabbed the colored woman by her dress and dragged her back inside. Then she turned and shook her fist at the train. She's a reb, he thought, and it surprised him, though he didn't know why he should be surprised that a woman who owned another person would be a reb. They were in Maryland and had been warned to watch out for rebels and their sympathizers, but it was still his first experience with a Southerner. He watched the house from the open window as the train pulled away, hoping for another sight of the woman. Now the country was changing. There had been farms all along and towns, but the trees seemed more spaced here, the pastures more open, and Charlie began to see poor farms. He heard of the men talking about them, the poor whites, but he still wasn't quite ready for the sight when the train slowed for a hill and passed a shack that was little more than boards tacked to some poles. The children running around out front were only half clothed and a man and a woman were sitting in rags. All the soldiers talked about the poor white trash and how these were the people they had come to fight, people who couldn't get out of their yards, let alone fight a proper army. It made him very conscious of, of his own home. Even without a father there, the house was in good shape and kept up and there was a well-tended garden, good food, clothes that covered bodies. He wondered how the rebels thought they could fight a war when their people couldn't dress themselves. It made him sad to see the children barely clothed. What would happen to them in winter? They did not have much of a winter here, he knew, nothing like Minnesota's, but it would still be cold. He turned from the window just as a man next to him, a private named Swenson, said, you could throw a cat through their house without hitting a wall. They don't have anything, Charlie said, not a thing. The man nodded. This ain't gonna be much of a war. I don't see how they can fight. They don't have any clothes. Hell, it'll all probably be over before they get to Washington, Swenson said. And Charlie nodded, but stopped talking because he did not like profanity, even of a low order. And there was much of it around. He thought of a surgeon who had spoken to them and told them to try to wear clean clothing going into battle in case they were hit by a rifle ball. If the cloth carried into the wound, clean cloth would cause less infection. He had thought of it and taken a bullet from one of the paper cartridges and pushed it against his sleeve. It didn't seem possible that the bullet could be made to go through his sleeve into him, into him carrying the fabric with it. He thought it must be the same way with profanity and immoral thinking. Charlie believed in heaven and hell and God and Jesus and wanted to be with God if he was killed. If he had profane thoughts as he went to war, they might infect his soul as the dirty clothes would infect his wound. And while he did not think he would die, did not think he would even be hit or hurt, did not think of it at all, still it was best to be careful. He stared out the window and thought of all the things he would tell his mother and his brother Oren when he wrote his next letter. I'm a man now, he would write, and seeing and doing a man's things out in the world, I've seen things you wouldn't believe. He leaned back, closed his eyes and let the gentle rocking of the train take him to sleep. And that's where we're going to stop today. All right, um, you have a short assignment in Google Classroom um, over what we read today. Um, you guys at home, you can go and get started on that.